Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Aquay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, my very special guest is John Flaherty. John is a former Catholic priest and the author of the book, Addiction Unplugged, How to Be Free. Addiction Unplugged is the first book of its kind to be written about addiction recovery from the perspective of conscious awareness. John's book and approach is a radical departure from the traditional ways of treating addictions. It draws on modern-day scientific discoveries, ancient spiritual wisdom, and real-life testimonies. John explains how Addiction Unplugged helps to steer one's belief system away from victim mentality and into a more compelling, spiritually aware, and empowered way of living. The discussion was fabulous, and John's conviction about his work can be felt throughout our discussion. And to kick the conversation off, I asked John to tell us a bit about his journey in life, and here is what he had to say. I was born into a Catholic family in England, in the northeast of England. I have an older sister, uh, had an older sister, she's now departed, and a younger brother. And uh, my mother is still alive, my father is also now passed on to the next life. A good family unit, strong, happy family unit, generally speaking. And because of the Catholic background, that became kind of part and parcel of our everyday uh, routine. I think from a very, very early time, Mike, of course, because of that, because of my being exposed to the Catholic tradition, and it was such a regular part of our life and living, naturally there was always a kind of a, a, a directing that way. But... Even before I had decided to, to do anything about my life that would involve me being part of the church, as I was, as, as time went on, I actually became a Catholic priest many years later. Uh, right from the outset, from about the age of, say, four or five, I was certainly recognizing about myself that not only did I view my own life differently to most other people around me, but that I made sense of life generally so very differently, even to my other family members. And that has continued to be the case. So much so that I've never really been able to settle into any one specific mould, any one particular way of doing life. Uh, I've always had the urge or the, um, the prompt to want to see if there's more to it than perhaps I have been shown or learned how to do. And uh, as I went through life, uh, everything I encountered was a case of me looking for the something else, that which seemed to be missing from me, that which seemed to be missing from the bigger picture of things. I remember distinctly going through my early schooling, for example, and um, I didn't find any any of the academic side of things very easy. In fact, I was very fearful at school. I was so frightened of getting something wrong that I rarely actually got anything very right in terms of academics. Um, so it was a struggle. Um, that was because, for the most part, of uh, very fear-mongering um, teachers <laughs> who would literally put the fear of God into their students. And certainly anybody like myself that didn't ordinarily have that left-brained way of thinking was always going to struggle, and I did. And yet, when it came to anything creative, anything about writing, anything about imagination, anything about the spiritual world, anything about the artistic side of life or the music side of life, there was never a problem. And that has continued to be the case. And so more and more I've had to deliberately veer away from that left-sided way of thinking of things to the right-sided brain and then be able to make perfect sense of everything. I went into the priesthood uh, from a very early age, 11 years old, still a little boy, went right through the normal schooling years, right through to about 18, and then started into the, the proper study as such to the priesthood, uh, training in philosophy, theology, the scriptures, uh, ethics, all of those kinds of areas. Again, never finding them particularly easy just to take on at face value, but always kind of looking to see there must be more than this. There must be more to it than what I'm just being given as information to take in. And of course, there is. There's a whole world of differences with all of those subject areas. As I went through that, I, I distinctly remember being introduced to things like uh, the Trinity, you know, the, the whole thing of the concept of uh, three persons making one God, 
And there was always a great emphasis on, you know, this is an unfathomable mystery. We can never hope to understand the depth, the purpose of trying to, of the understanding of three persons, three personas, but making one God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Well, my, for the life of me, I could not see what was difficult about that. Because, you know, father-son relationship is that union of oneness uh, that even, you know, in my very young age, I would have known was the one and only message of Christ speaking. You know, I and the Father are one, and the spirit of that that is imbued will be the very spirit that in actual fact will always draw you back to that understanding of oneness whichever way you look at life and whatever it is you encounter in life the non-separation from our source will be that that at the end of the day would see you through any problem any difficulty any diversity any division now that was my very very simplistic way of seeing things but as a result it has served me incredibly well because the less I allowed myself in a fearful way to be bogged down by the dogmas and the doctrines and the insistencies that it, subject matters had to be learned and then reiterated and then shared with others in that very, very limited capacity, of course I developed the freedom within my own heart and soul to be able to share in a very common sense way that which really did make sense to the ordinary everyday person when they too were wanting to have some discovery of their own spiritual sense of self and indeed their own spiritual understanding of what this thing we call life is. And yet as I went through those years of the priesthood and then when I did actually leave the priesthood, having really felt that it was incredibly stifling for me to try to limit myself within the parameters of that, Lo and behold, as I moved through into different professions, and particularly the one that I've, I've been in for the last oh, 20 or more years, that of the field of addiction, uh, where people, largely speaking, are desperate to find a new understanding of, that, of their self and to make a new sense of life. Well, I find I'm doing the very same thing, as always I have done, but with a different language, with a greater freedom of expression, and yet still finding within that field there are the same kind of confines and limitations placed on a person moving through their addictive behaviours as indeed the church had in my experience of making sense of me and, the, and of God, of, of the divine. And again I've had to, to constantly therefore find myself crossing the, the barriers, crossing the, the boundaries, the limitations in order to keep, keep that sense, very sensible to me, and to be able to make it very easily understood by those desperately to seek more from their life. And so a little example of that being that in the world of addiction, largely dominated still by the 12-step approach, AA, NA, right across the world you'll find that evidence of you know that program being the ready-made one made available to the masses, and even when people don't necessarily go down that line, there's still this very, very, very strong emphasis on what isn't evidence-based literally is not worth even thinking about. And of course, again, you know, from my point of view, straight back to that very, very, very limiting sense of how do we ever discover anything new about ourselves or about life whenever we're going to box ourselves in to such an extent. So, you know, just to answer your first question there about how do things start and where am I now? Do you know, I'm one that's constantly been curious, never really been able to settle very easily for those ready-made answers and certainly not been one that has been able to fit into a box of limitation. And I found it very difficult to allow others to remain in theirs when I've seen a readiness for people to expand and to grow and to develop and to discover the true worth and who they really are and what this thing we call life absolutely is. So, John, some excellent, excellent points there because my own experience is that the society and our culture likes to keep us constrained. It likes to keep us in a box. It likes to keep us left brain oriented. Sure. Right? Follow the rules. Don't deviate. This is the program. And it keeps people away from their expanded consciousness. Away from the spirituality. You talked before about as long as you're not separated from source, things are going to be okay. 
but it's that separation which yeah. creates huge problems for people. That's my personal huge, view, at least. Huge problem. Well, thanks for sharing that, Mike. So we're definitely on the same wavelength. It's not surprising you do what you do, what I'm currently doing, what <laughs> I think I'm doing, because it's the same kind of doing. But it's the same soul searching. You see, I, I, heart, I do believe heart and soul, that my own heart and soul, that your heart and soul, and that every individual heart and soul already knows all that there is to know. And just that our body and mind are literally having to play catch up. Unfortunately, the systems that we have in place, be it religious or be it in the world of addiction uh, treatment and recovery or in education itself, primarily right across the board, it is that very, very black and white way of this is how it's done. And if you're not doing it this way, then you couldn't possibly be doing it right. And right. therefore, there is the possibility of doing this thing called life wrong. And of course, that's a nonsense. A complete and utter nonsense. I also am with you in the sense that I, I'm, I've come to the realization that it has been very deliberately set out that way. Very, very deliberately controlled, manufactured, and there is a high preference for people to be left in ignorance, not utilizing their true potential, not exercising anything at all of their spirit, and allowing their soul to, to literally cry inside there must be more to life than this and indeed there is now, i i've come to the, the realization that anyone who gets caught up in any form of addictive behavior and there are a myriad of different ways by which that can be but we'll take the more obvious ones of alcohol or drug addiction drug dependency I have never worked over the 20 or more years with any individual who finds themselves to be in such a place who does not know that, of course, there must be more to life than their current experience is being experienced. They know that, but for the life of them have not yet been able to give themselves the permission to actually just see it through, express themselves in the manner in which they need to be expressed, and to find, of course, the completion of themselves that they're so, so much longing to have as their experience. And unfortunately, the various programs and processes that have been made available to us do anything but allow for that. They simply actually add yet another layer, yet another set of rules, dogmas, rituals, regulations, steps to go through by which we think we have to still make some kind of change, still find some way of improving our lot in life in order to at last meet the requirements of a somebody or a someplace or a something else. And of course, that's such a lie about life. It's so very unnecessary. I find that the same thing that you find, that people are searching and seeking. They know there's something else. It's, they know there's something broader to existence. But what happens is what I'll hear, and I don't, you tell me if you hear the same thing, is they'll say, but you know, Mike, I don't know how to connect. I don't know how to do this. How do you do that? And so what I'm seeing when they say that to me is they're looking, again, for a process. Absolutely. They're looking yeah. for a left-brain-oriented process. There's some way to do this. Or could you give me the steps on how to do that, not realizing that the process is contained and comes from within you? I don't need to give you a map because each person's connection is specific to that individual. It's very going to be very specific because we are very unique and necessarily so, so that we can each of us bring that uniqueness to the world. It's how we create. We cannot, in fact, not create, Mike. We're all creators. You know, religions don't get very many things right. But the one thing that perhaps they do, and most would agree on, in fact, the term most readily used is, we're made in the image and likeness of the creator. Now, you know, make of that what you will, but one thing that it is really stating, as clear as day is, if we're in the image and the likeness of, we're one and the same. There is no separation. You know, the source of life that is sourcing you and me and everybody here listening to your program, that source of life is who and what we are. That is who we are. We, and as a result, we cannot not create. 
Now, we can be creating havoc in our lives, chaos, right. or we can be creating absolute magnificence, but we cannot not create. So I, I lay great emphasis on how important it is for us to become consciously aware of that, that we can never be separated from the source of life that sources us, and as a result of that, that we cannot not create, that we're creating all of the time, and that the uniqueness of that creation is crucial to the creation of all that is. So there's no getting anything wrong. There cannot be any such thing as failure. Feedback we get, but failure just does not enter in. Now, in the, the field of addiction, in that whole arena where people have been made to feel that they don't fit in, that they could possibly be getting something very, very wrong, that they have been an out-and-out failure in life, of course they think of themselves as nothing but the one who creates a difficulty for another, that they have got everything very, very wrong, that somehow or other life has drawn them the, the short straw and that for whatever reason they're almost a blight on the planet rather than a creation in their own right. I cannot wear that at all because I hear the soul of the person crying out, there must be more to life than this and indeed there absolutely is and that must be called forth. Honoured, absolutely honoured. So in the work that I have been doing over the years, Mike, you know, I see that my work is as helpful and as important to the, those who are affected by the life of somebody who's caught up in the world of addiction, as indeed it is for the person who is desperately seeking another expression of themselves but hasn't yet found out how to do that. Because that's really what addiction is. It is absolute deep desire and, you know, full credit to the person who, in their ingenuity, goes to the greatest, greatest feats to find out how to quell the otherwise unhappiness that is deeply lying within, the emptiness that they need to absolutely fulfill. And if that comes through excessing in alcohol or with food or with any other substitute for that, that, you know, hats off to their ingenuity because, yes, it does work. It makes the unbearable momentarily, though it be, more bearable. It works. It works. Mm. It takes away the pain. It removes an emptiness. It dissolves the experience of separation. However, I do believe wholeheartedly, of course, that there's so much more than just stopping off at the spirit in the bottle. That's an actual fact. The real spirit within is still yearning for completion. And when the addiction is going on in the life of an individual, it's far too easy for the system and far too much of an excuse for those related to that person to believe that when they get fixed, all will be well again with the world. I worked for a number of years in a uh, a, a very expensive, expensive in the sense of very high fee paying amounts of money to have a son or a, a, you know, a partner sent to, it was an all male residential retreatment center in the west coast of Canada. And, you know, the, the belief obviously there from family relatives was as long as I send my son or my husband, or my partner, off to this place, when he comes back fixed, I might actually be able to accept him again. I might even be able to like him again. It's a little bit of a stretch to think I might be able to love him again after all the devastation he has caused in my life and all the disruption that has gone on because of his behaviours. But I have a feeling that we might then be able to be reconciled. And, you know, Mike, that, that is such an impossible thing to ask of the person going through their recovery process. Because unlike many of the, the different programs and treatment services available, I don't believe that the only measure of a person's success is how reconciled they can be 
to their family members again. Because nine times out of ten, it has been that very, very unhappy and impossible situation that has led to the person becoming addicted in the first place by actually trying to fit the mould of that which has been set before them. And it's usually by family members. So a person, you know, a young man or would come into a, that recovery treatment centre and because they were out of their environment, because of they're out of the way of their regular routine of using drugs or drinking excessively, of course, once their system had detoxed from the process of that, once they were eating more regularly, because they were in a completely different environment with a new routine and new things happening, because they were meeting friends of a similar age group who they could actually interact with more healthily and begin to look after their health, their physical life, their mental capacity, and actually begin to even consider a spiritual aspect, an emotional aspect about themselves, then amazing things began to happen. Because I have never ever discovered a person who's been in addiction that has had difficulty with the language I have been using to express the very things I'm expressing to you today, that we can never be separated from our source, that we cannot not create, that I am who I say that I am. And finally, you know, that, that the meaning of life is indeed the meaning that I give to it. Now, when a person begins to allow that, newfound discovery about themselves, amazing things begin to happen. Because it's a process of giving the self, small s, back to their self, capital S, the truth of who they are, rather than the trying desperately hard to learn how to do life a different way, simply and solely, so that it fits with the ready-made expectation of those who are insisting that it comes from, from them, in that particular way. That's an impossibility. That's another violation. That's never ever going to work. And that's wholly inadequate. At the same time, however, if a family member allows the same invitation that is coming from life to themselves, as indeed it is to the person in addiction, to grow, to expand, and to see what else life is actually asking of us all, then of course they too can step up to the plate and discover there's so much more about themselves than perhaps they had allowed themselves to see, just as indeed that has been the expectation of their husband, their partner, their son, their daughter, their loved one, who's trying to find the very same self-discovery in their addictive process. You know, it's something, in other words, that affects all and everyone at the very same time. It's a beautiful invitation if we can see it as that. So even our addictive behaviours can, in actual fact, become the very launching pad, the start of something that yet opens up a, a vista of opportunity potential and, most importantly, the freedom to express and to be who you truly are rather than that tiny, tiny stifled way of who you've learned to become and hoping like hell it will work out for you. Because it won't. It can't. It's not supposed to. Now, John, your approach is shattering paradigms, without a question of a doubt. And I'm listening to what you're saying, and John is a 180 <laughs> uh, from what is traditional treatment methods, and I think it's fabulous. Well, I, you know, it's good for you to hear. And, of course... You know, I, I would, it would be wrong of me to pretend that the words I'm speaking to you today and to your listeners does not usually have that very same response. Because, of course, it does resonate as long as, as long as John gets out of the way of being John. And as long as I can speak from my soul to the soul of the other, of course it will always resonate and make sense. Of course it will. Because that's that sameness. That's that oneness taking judgment completely out of the picture. That's, unfortunately, what sits right at the heart of most of our current um, programs, treatment, and recovery processes. It's really all a question of, can you get through this obstacle course with your relapse prevention plan, with your moral inventory about yourself, 
with all the stipulations that, you know, you're now going to try your best to adhere to, attend as many meetings as you possibly can muster, and then you'll be okay. Mike, that's not a living, that's a dying to live, you know? Right. That cannot be our purpose in being here. Well, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, right? This is what they're told. What is that? What is that? What is that? And you know, my, in actual fact, I and I have no, you know, I'm not making light of this. I know it's a torrid, torrid experience, not only for the person going through addictive behaviors and dependencies on any kind of substance or on any kind of activity, but it does also create mayhem in the home and the family of anybody trying to be close to that person through that process. However, if we take judgment out of the picture and really see it as an opportunity, a really wonderful opportunity for everyone involved to see what it is that is missing, that is actually making this journey such a difficult process that it appears to be, we'll quickly realize that it's fear, that it's the possibility that some one person has got something very wrong here, and then there's guilt, of course, to be addressed. And there's the fact that the belief, which has been regimented, driven into us, and which we're constantly stuck in, in thinking could be true, that there is no recovery. Yep, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Once a drink, then you're, you know, you're done for. All of that kind of thing. And yet, Mike, there's not a scrap, there's not a shred of current day science that actually supports that. You know, it's just not so. It's dogma. And it is just dogma. It is rigid belief passed on by word of mouth from one to another to another to another unendingly and regurgitated until we've come to think it true. And that, of course, is the whole thing that runs right through every education system, is it not? You know, that right from the very outset, you know, this belief that first truth about whatever comes from an authority. Now, we never now often get to ask ourselves who that authority is or where did they get their authority from to be the authority. But we just take it in, hoop, line, and sinker, as any child going through educational processes soon discovers. So truth comes from authority. Next comes, you know, intelligence is the ability to remember and then just repeat. Remember, repeat, remember, repeat. Totally robotic in our actions. The next wave that comes across in any kind of educational system is accurate memory and repetition will always be rewarded. So, you know, as long as you are actually fulfilling all that we've already drilled into you, you will be okay. That's our promise to you. How could you possibly go wrong? You may not feel very human, but as long as you're getting this right, then you'll be okay. Then comes, you know, wave number four. Non-compliance, well, there are going to be recompenses here. There's going to be the possibility of punishment because you're getting something clearly very wrong. And this is going to take us all a lot longer, you know, to have to go all over again because you're just not getting this. And then finally, you know, the insistence that we begin to conform, that we just, you know, stop the resistance and that far more intellectually and far more socially do we accept that the authority had it right in the first place and we were just very slow learners? Could we not have got there a little bit more quickly? Now, right running through all of that, Mike, there's not a scrap of freedom about that. There's not a single thing that breathes any kind of spirit through a person. There is nothing that brings life. That's a dying. That is such a stifling, stifling attitude toward life. And you, you'll see it run right through all of the different religions. You will see it very, very, very much as the backbone to all kinds of treatment and recovery processes, be it the traditional 12-step one or even in our more conventional attempts, but still with that rather punishing and authoritative end-of-the-day requirement that's made of each person. A belief, first of all, in the, uh, that there's a perfection to be reached, a place of acceptance, and that until you reach that, you're still at the place of failure. You've got something terribly wrong. You're a blight on society. You're a misery to yourself. You're a hardship to the family. What on earth it is that you have done that has caused everybody such difficulty? 
<laughs> and again, you know, there could be no no scrap of truth in that. Well, basically, they're telling people that you're essentially useless. Yes. And, uh, right? And you talked about you yes. talked about authority, John. You know, in society, in our culture, everyone is an authority except you. That everyone, is what people live every, under. Everyone except you. Right. That you could not possibly simply live your own truth and that that in itself will not suffice. The reason a person gets stuck in addictive behaviors is because they no longer feel the ease and the ability to express their natural state of joy. Their natural state. I don't mean just because they don't know how to good, have a good time. They do, they well know how to have a good time. They have a good drink they can use to excess. That's having a good time. That's partying. Even when they know that that is incredibly short-lived. But that's not the natural joy that they're longing to actually experience and to express. The natural joy is to that they feel a rightful place in life, an acceptable place on this planet. And of course, the origins of any addictive behavior begins in the imprint years, between about the age of zero or in the womb, down to about the age of six, seven year old. That's when everything about life gets to be imprinted on our unconscious mind until it becomes our conscious way of living. And before you know it, you know, we fit the mold exactly in the manner in which our parents particularly, other family members before us, schools that we went to, religions or cultural impacts that were had on us have actually determined that it be so. But of course, as we're doing that, the natural joy, the uniqueness, the expression of our heart and soul is being absolutely squashed out of sight. That's why a person addicts, desperate to find some measure of something else that they can find release from, find expression from, find some kind of semblance of there must be something from life. And I'll try this. I know it won't really suffice, but it's better than the misery of not having a drink. Or not using. You know, it doesn't take rocket science to work out why a person would use or drink to excess or eat excessively or not eat and almost want to disappear, become invisible. You know, they're all, they're all behaviors that are learned by desperately trying to fit in to an unreal expectation of somebody who has placed an authority before us. And generally speaking, that's our parents right from the very beginning. We could have the best parents in the world. I happen to think that they were mine, you know? <laughs> yep. And yet, I know, like all parents, even if we did have wonderful, wonderful people parenting us, we'll often say, you know I only want the best for you, don't you? And of course, that's precisely it. That's where the problem lies as much as the solution. Because it is their best. And their best, no matter how wonderful their best is, couldn't possibly be compared to the source of life from which we call, ah, from which we're sourced. So we come from that source of life intact, with full potential, with everything laid before us as a possible expression of how we want to live and how we want to be in this life. And then within no time, we're already beginning to unlearn that, to have it knocked out of us. You know, I, I have been gifted as I've written my book the, over this, just this last year, Addiction Unplugged, How to Be Free. And, you know, the, the gift that I have had as I've been writing this book is to have had my great nephew, who's now actually four years old, four and a half, it would remind me, in fact, if you were here. And, you know, that means he's only four and a half years away from the source of life from which he came. That's a beautiful, beautiful recognition because he's already, on, on the other hand, four and a half years now into learning who he's not. Yes. And is already, a, despite our love and care and attention and great ideas for him, beginning to discover somebody else's version of life and replacing it for his pure potential. 
You see, Aidan didn't decide to call himself Aidan. That name was chosen for him, just like Mike was chosen for Mike and John for John. And everything else chosen for me. My Catholic faith was the one that was presented to me as, this is the way we do things in this family. And so it quickly became mine. The soccer team, the red and white striped football team that I have enjoyed watching over the years. Only why? Because that was the team that the family had always supported beforehand. You know, those things weren't even brought into question. And so we just very, very easily start to adopt not only the pluses, but all the drawbacks and added to that how we've interpreted them for ourselves in that very short space of time. But one thing is for certain. We forget the essence of what my great nephew Aidan is still already showing in his life, that he is aware sufficiently that if it isn't happening now, it just isn't happening. You know, I can convince Hayden that he had a great time yesterday. Wasn't it wonderful when we played this game or that game? Or wasn't it fantastic when... And he'll look at me blank. (laughs) Because, Mike, if it's not happening in Hayden's world now, it simply does not exist. Yeah. If I talk to him about the wonderful things we might do tomorrow, he'll just say, well, can we not just do it now? That that is a beautiful recognition, and that's what we lose. I was just, just, we, just this very week, actually, uh, the uh, writer that I, I like the writings of, this guy called Adia Shanti. And Adia Shanti is a spiritual teacher, and I just glanced today at a, a, a piece of his writing. It says, you know, make no mistake about it. Enlightenment is a destructive process. It has nothing to do with becoming better or being happier. Enlightenment is the crumbling away of untruth. It's seeing through the facade of pretense. It's the complete eradication of everything we imagined to be true. Now, when most people think of enlightenment, they think, oh, isn't this going to be great? We live this lovely, you know, nice, pink, fluffy kind of state with peace and well-being and everything's just hunky-dory and everything falls nicely into place and we don't have to do anything. And, of course, not surprisingly, it's very easily debunked. But when I talk about enlightenment or when I talk about a person really awakening to the truth of who they are, I'm really meaning, like Adi Ashanti is describing there, that we forget all that we have learned about ourselves, or about addiction, or about addiction recovery, or about life, and we actually give ourselves back to the self that actually knows that none of that is necessary at all in order to live a very, very content, very peace-filled, very complete way of living. So it's an unlearning and an unknowing. Everything that we thought we had to learn and everything that we thought was so important to know. And in the truth of that, it's very difficult to see why we would ever need to encounter a difficulty or a problem with anything. And those who have had the privilege of working with, in the manner in which I have been working with them, going through their addictive behaviours, have, of course, been able to recognise that. And it's been an enormous sigh of relief. Ah, I can, do you mean I can, do you mean I have a preference? Mm. Yeah, the discovery of a preference for those who have already been written off as being in repetitive, repetitious, addictive habits of behavior, Mike, is an awesome discovery. From addiction to move into a preference about themselves? Didn't even know that was on the cards. You mean I get to choose a different way of living, a different way of expressing? Absolutely. Did you know you can do that? And then to move from a place of preference to a place of newfound acceptance about self, everything has changed. Everything is different then. For myself then, for the person going through their addictive behaviors, long, long time ago, I happily dropped the necessity for the term being in recovery. Yeah. Because I, you know, I lost count, Mike over the years of how many people who had maybe repeated that, I'm in recovery, I'm in recovery. Maybe 30, 40 years, I'm in recovery. Well, you know, I had to often ask, well, 
what are you in recovery from? I've been to all kinds of different places in the world, asked all kinds of groupings and individuals the very same question. What is it you're in recovery from? It's usually being in blank silence. Okay, so I moved on to the next question. Well, how long is it going to take to recover? Oh, wow, I never thought of that one. How will you ever know when you're recovered? I don't know. <laughs> it's amazing. But it is amazing, Mike. And of course, the reason being is people have got so used to taking on that terminology about themselves. Right, categorized and labeled. Oh, hugely, you know, that they've come to think of that I am in recovery. That is who I am. Right. Well, you know, no, 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 just a huge no. That cannot be who you are and all that you are meant to be an expression of. Rather, when a person does begin to join the dots and see the magic of their life and, and then understand exactly how they've come to do the detrimental things to themselves and to others through their addictive behaviours that they maybe have, then it's not a process of recovering anything. It becomes a process of discovery. What is there to be discovered? We can discover first and foremost who we are not. I'm not my mother. I'm not my father. I'm not my addiction. I'm not my addiction recovery. I'm not my job. Who am I? The discovery, first of all, the sifting out, though, of all that you are not, opens up huge avenues. Because only then can you discover, you know, something more of that which might be more truly reflective and expressive of who you are. What do you do next, then? Next level of conscious awareness is... Just like a dog looking for its bone, you know you've left it somewhere, but you go and uncover the truth of who you really are and be that. Be that. Warts and all, imperfections and all, you know. Be that. The understanding of which will change everything. Everything. Finally, last wave, if you like, of conscious awareness, last great Understanding to be on earth, empower yourself, small s, by yourself, capital S. The understanding of which, just like my great nephew Aidan knows full well, will change everything. Is, indeed, everything. You know, it's everything. Now, Mike, there's nothing that gives me more joy, my soul more joy, natural joy. When I'm privileged to sit with another person who begins to hear that message and knows in their heart and soul that at last they've found what their heart has been looking for. Yeah, oh, wow. Why was I not shown this earlier? Why are we not taught this in school? Why does this not come through our religions? But it just doesn't. But the truth of it, nonetheless, is always there. It is always, always there. And anyone, you know, who is listening to us today, and, you know, I, I hope that amongst those who have been listening to your program today, and it's great that you put this station out and made available to people, who are either in or have been in that long-term need for recovery from their addictive behaviours, or indeed if there are others who are so worried out of their minds about another person who's going through this and are at an absolute loss about what they can do to assist that process. You know, I, I really would want to assure every single one of you that, of course, it does not need to be, and it can be a much easier road than we have made it into, and the process of treatment and recovery in itself, woefully inadequate as it has been, is yet to really be hugely expanded. That's my current work. I'd be very, very happy to assist any individual, wherever they are, because of this marvelous thing we call Skype. It is made possible. And, you know, I really would encourage people to make that contact, certainly with myself initially, whatever they do thereafter, of course, is whatever they do thereafter. But if there's anybody think, oh, wow, i have got to hear a little bit more of this, this at last sounds true and right, this resonates with me, then, you know, I really say, 
me, if you get in contact with me, I'd be delighted to make that contact and connection. I was just going to ask, John, how potential clients would get involved and engage the process that you have. Yeah. So essentially they would contact you, there would be Skype sessions, those types of sure, things? Sure, You know, easiest ways to reach me, well, uh, the website for myself is uh, www dot be aware be alive dot com be aware be alive all written as one dot com a direct email address if they wish to just contact me straight away by email john dot be aware be alive at gmail dot com you know once making connection with me that way we can set up depending on where you're located whether or not we want to use uh, Skype uh, as I'm doing with you today, my works incredibly well. You know, the ideal, of course, would have somebody in the very same room as me, but, you know, it's like I'm sitting in the room with you here today, Mike, and it, it does work very effectively, very well. So, yeah, sure, make contact with me. That would be the first invitation that I believe life would be making through my voice to that individual who's really ready to take the next step. And there's the book, of course, that I have written, you know, Addiction Unplugged, How to Be Free, people for a long enough were saying, you know, why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book? And I procrastinated about that far too long, you know, and, and it was really unnecessary for me to be doing that. Got on, quickly put the book together, and I know that that can also be a very, very helpful means, or at least an opening to those that just want to, to get a, another feel for this maybe different sounding approach to something that can actually Bring again to life the person who at one time thought that they were a dead person walking. That has been my experience so many times. That is why I do what I do. And of course, as I do that, because it's the same message that my heart and soul and every one of the cells in my body wants to similarly hear, you know, I get to benefit as well. Because it's a message we all need to be reminding ourselves. If it isn't coming from elsewhere, and we really have to keep giving it to ourselves. Now, John, so, is it a program when they contact you? Do you have them, okay, look, this is going to be a set number of sessions. How does that work? It, it doesn't, Mike. It doesn't have to be hard and fast in any way at okay. all. In fact, you know, it, that, that can be, as I've been describing today, sometimes one of the most off-putting things. A person might want to simply email and be done. Another person might want to make a call on Skype or come to see me in person, and that could be something. It is possible that we could do in a group Skype. You know, people like to work as a group or indeed as a family, and I would be certainly open to that. But, you know, it, it, I, I would never sit with another individual already having decided what needs to be done and what the program is going to be because everybody is unique. Everybody will be starting at this from a different starting place, and it's so important that we honor that and, and, then, and then see where things develop from there. Now, John, the um, success, if you could just maybe talk a little bit about what types of shifts and changes you're seeing in the folks that you're working with, maybe perhaps those folks that have gone through traditional treatments and then they come to you. Could you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah sure. I'll try. <laughs> I'm laughing in a sense because in the various places, when I was doing more conventional types of work in some of the different treatment centers or recovery homes or wherever, you know, inevitably the different people, the clients coming into those programs would immediately ask, you know, John, what's your success rate? <laughs> right? And I would, with, with a little bit of tongue in cheek, I would say 100%. Oh, John, you know, you couldn't be. That's not possible. <laughs> That's not possible. And, of course, they were already talking themselves out of it, no matter how possible it was going to be. But, it, but you know, I would deliberately say that, Mike, because... You see, it was never going to be what my success rate is, you know. My success rate, I could say, okay, it's 100. It's far more important. About what, what degree of shift, of change are you really ready for, you know? Because there's no way that can happen until a person has reached the point of answering yes to, have you had enough yet? Yeah. You know, but once we get to, we're like, oh, God. Of course I've had enough of this. You know, I've exhausted my addiction and my addictive behavior is exhausting me. And of course I have had enough. Once a person has reached that point, 
the success is is already laid out, if you want to say that. Because after a matter, after that, it's a process of a rediscovery of their truth, of who they really are, which I believe is the bottom, at the very core of every person's addictive behavior and desperate desire to know that the answer to who they are is what they're driving at, desperately searching for, and which, of course, isn't hidden at all from them. Not at all. And will become very, very apparent once they simply give themselves the permission slip to allow, forget all the things they thought they had to learn and rehash, regurgitate, uh, make work, even though it seemed like totally unworkable. Forget all of that stuff. That's far too much like hard work. And you must have had enough of that by now. And relax. And take your rightful place. Speak the truth of every individual and unique thing that you have to offer this world. And you will soon know your rightful place in it without the necessity to be on such self-destruct. So it sounds like they have to be, clients would need to be committed, motivated. So just, they know that they definitely are done with the other. Yeah. And they don't quite know yet, could there possibly be anything else in this life for me? And I would be the one to be saying, my friend, it has only just begun. You have no idea how exciting, how exhilarating the run is from here on in. You know? Come on home. Come and make your way back home. I mentioned before, some folks, they are very programmed to believe that in order to make their connection to spirit, to know who they really are, that there's some kind of process, there's some kind of roadmap that John's going to give me and I'm going to get from point A to point B. What do those talks go like? Well, you know, I've mentioned them already, and he's probably going to be my best help for, for some years to come yet, in my great nephew, Aidan, or indeed in any young person that they also know. Because if they can use that measure of the, per, of the being who hasn't yet forgotten to remember the source from which he or she came, and that they too, once remembering that, before ever they learn to become who they were not, that's the refreshing starting place. So it's not a process of learning, it's a process of remembering. So with that, with that knowledge, with that place of realignment, feeling more congruent with life itself, forgetting that you're up against it, you're not up against life. Life's just lifing us. What we do with life is another matter altogether. And we, so we would look at, you know, what have we been doing with life? What thoughts have we been thinking about it that's made it so difficult? What beliefs behind the thoughts have made it seem so impossible? What behaviours stemming from the thoughts have made it seem unbearable? And what life situations have come from the behaviours that have made it seem like you're living in hell? So we'd look at beliefs. Where did the beliefs come from? Are you going to still continue to believe them, even if they appear to be no longer working? Our beliefs create our thoughts. Our thoughts create our behaviours. Our behaviours create our life situations. More of the same life situations, guess what? More of the same beliefs. More of the same beliefs, more of the same thoughts. More of the same thoughts, more of the same behaviours. More of the same, you know, you know, you know. Okay? Right, exactly. So. How do we make change? We interrupt the pattern. Just like you can do on the computer, we do a nice little cut and paste job. We break the loop. Try this as a new belief. Does that one at last feel more true to you? How does it feel? How does it fit? What does life look like through that lens? What thoughts do you have now? What do the thoughts bring about? What behaviors would you now like to behave? What are the life situations that now unfold? So in that sense, of course there's a pattern to it. There's life's pattern. That's how life is working all of the time. And the only thing that perhaps most people in addiction have thought was missing from life was themselves, their self. That has been what has been missing. Their self in it, their truest expression, their grandest version of their greatest vision, if you like. That is what needs to, to be gently, firmly, directly, lovingly replaced 
you get all this fear stuff of, you know, you're going to turn into a pumpkin if you don't go to your meetings or if you don't keep your relapse prevention plan going or if you, you know, something dreadful is going to happen to you. Of course it isn't. Of course it isn't. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece from In Alice in Wonderland, you know, because I could tell you my adventures beginning from this morning, said Alice, a little timidly, but it's no good going back to yesterday because I was a different person then. You know, it's so true. We're changing all of the time, Mike. Everything is changing. Nothing remains unchanged. People like Deepak Chopra years ago reminding us of things like that, wasn't he? You know, that we make a new liver every six weeks and a new skin once a month. And, you know, we have a whole new skeleton every three months and new brain cells every year. And our DNA is changing every six weeks. So, you know, nobody can possibly think that it's impossible to recover from an addictive behavior, learned though it may have been, as a result of a violatory or maybe very abusive circumstances in their imprint years. And sometimes people think, well, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't abused and, you know, I, you know I, I'm, I've been addicted for years, but I had a very happy childhood. Well, I assure you, you could not have had. Because whatever it is that you've conveniently forgotten to remember was still must have been a repression in those early years that you're still repressing in your adult years that is not enabling your natural joy, your natural ease of expression to really so fully be you that you could think that there's anything possibly missing or incomplete about yourself. So it is important to bring closure and healing to whatever did set the ball rolling in the first place, and which we just continue to accumulate as a belief, added by another thought, a recurring behavior, becoming a life situation, and snowballing and snowballing to convince ourselves that we're less than, that we're unworthy, that there could be no other way out, because, of course, that's just keeping the lie in place, forgetting the truth. That's sitting there just as readily to be received as ever indeed the lie was that you conjured up, made up about yourself. Well, John, you know, it's an amazing message you have. This has been an absolute fabulous discussion and a pleasure to have you on the show. It really has been. And we are pushing up against the hour here, but what I'd like to do is to extend to you to come back anytime you'd like to come back because I think your message is so, so important. People do need to hear this, and I think they need to hear it more than just once. So you have an open invitation to come back anytime you'd like. That's beautiful, Mike, and I'll certainly take you up on that because I know that this is important to keep speaking this message. Yes. Uh, I believe that this message, and it is this message. I, I keep saying it's the, it's the message far more important than the messenger, but the message is a message of life. It really, really is, and I, that's why I, I have great a privilege, and it is an honor for me to be able to share with the, the audience, the listeners that you have at present. Um, thank you for that opportunity, Mike. And again, you know, I, I, I hope that any and all of those people who are listening now or indeed in any future time will always feel comfortable and at ease in absolute confidence to be able to make contact with me, should they so wish. Hopefully pick up the book. That's easy enough to do. You know, choices. You can either take a look at the book have a little glance at my website, make direct contact with me, uh, any or all of those things, and I assure you that I will um, work very, very closely with you, uh, very, very respectfully with you, and absolutely honour the greatness that as yet needs to be unfolded and, 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 be, and be made very present in your life, whoever you are at this point in time. Well, thank you, John. Thank you so much again, and I'll definitely keep in touch. Thanks, Mike. All righty. Thanks to you and really wish you well. Thanks very much. Nicole. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Now. Namaste. And that concludes my interview with John Flaherty, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. John's book, again, is Addiction Unplugged, How to Be Free, and can be purchased on Amazon.com. His website is BeAwareBeAlive.com. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog, The Sage of Quay. Also, please take a listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia, by heading to my other website, laboroflovemusic.com. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. 
See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.